Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for the opportunity of speaking here. So I will tell a short story today that I think it puts a little bit of perspective of the kind of science that we do more on the molecular level, not on the gene networks today, but uh, I'll tell a little bit about the molecular motors. So uh, as you can see from the slide, we are very happy to be in Texas, and we have been very well treated by Texas. You can see the Prit and Welsh all right up there on the, on the acknowledgement. So I, I want to thank everybody and the reception and all that we have here. So if we think about machines, there's always the question basically, should we think about machines the way just like a, an engine? And then when I go to molecular machines, they just become smaller machines, or they're actually different. They're actually very different, basically. If you look at this slide, this is the clock at Prague. It's moving as a nice mechanical machine with parts and moving perfectly. But really, a molecular machine is much more something can melt and form all the time. It was much more on the Dali version of how clocks should look and not the Prague clock. Okay, so and that makes a big difference because the energies involved are the order of KT so they can dissolve your system. So there's this beautiful movie about the star of our talk today, the Skynesine. That's this molecular motor walking a microtube and carrying loads all the way around the cell. This is very nice, but you know this is a Hollywood picture. Couldn't be more wrong. Basically, there's a lot of inertia on this walk. And actually, when you run the simulation of our systems, they look much more like that. It's a very diffusive process that goes around. And the idea is, can we understand these things? So let's think about this way. That's how people used to do, second law of their dynamics, motors, you did all that. What we're really doing with machines where we have to go in a more situation where disorder and entropy and all these things go around, that's the task in hand that we are trying to go after. So with this in mind, how can we actually do something about this problem? As people know, myself and my friend Peter Wallace here that's been around somewhere in the room there, has been working a lot on protein folding, and, we, and the question is, can we learn from protein folding? But one thing we learned a lot about protein folding is that a lot of the interesting part that happens on biomolecules is not what happens when they're down there or what you see on the crystal structures, although crystal structures you're going to see save us. But actually, they give, the, they give the shape of the funnel, I'm going to tell you, you can get from these crystal structures, but the excited states are actually the most functional states that come around, and you can see how the, the success of looking at these dynamics of theory and structural biology can bring us to understanding these kind of problems. So the idea, basically, I'm just telling you, basically, people know, we'll be I'm sorry, we'll be talking about proteins. And as we are talking about proteins, we are interested on the form and how they form here on the protein folding problem. So, but how do proteins fold? To zero order, proteins try to get organized the situation using physical forces to help them. The simplest thing you can think about it is you can put sequences like this. I'm sorry, I'm always in the wrong bottle. Sequence that organize in a such a situation, like for example, if you have, think about amino acids just of two kinds, polar and hydrophobic. You know the polars try to get together with the polars, the hydrophobic try to get together with the hydrophobics, and you get structure where you try to phase separate these two structures. Some structures you cannot phase separate because of the sequence. It's very hard because you're constrained. These are the structures that are not protein-like. Protein-like are structures that try to go this way. But more than anything else, proteins try to do two things. They will tell you a little bit more. They try to make sure that the states you design, you can make all the attractive interactions together. And the states that you want to fight against, you cannot form attractive interactions. So it's a process of designing the state that you want versus counter design the states that you don't want. So with this in mind, we can think about it basically. Actually, the system is more complex. You actually don't have just two colors like oil and water. You actually have 20 colors, and they're different interactions. They're not totally orthogonal. There are variations of it, but you have a lot of creativity or how can you sort of get states that optimize the state you want to go in favor against the states that you want to go against. So many years ago, even before I moved on this field, Peter got interested in this problem. That's why I got interested in this problem, by reading a paper from him. It's the fact that basically, if you think about my simple protein, my protein only has two colors, only hydrophobic and hydrophilic. 
The question is, if I do a, if I do a structure where I have half of the sequence of beads of one color and half of the sequence of beads of different color, and the model I just show you, beads of the same color attract each other, beads of different color repel each other, if I just do a random sequence, the system is going to try to do that phase separate, that oil and water picture, where you try to separate the hydrophobic from the hydrophilic, but you cannot do that all the time. You may end up with interactions that are unhappy, and that's what we call frustrating interactions. Right? Because the fact is, the sequence doesn't force you. So if you do this experiment many, many times with the sequence, you may end up with many structures that are very different. These low energy structures, they may be very different. Why do you have many different low energy structures? Because where, every time I do the experiments, where these wrong contacts happen, they happen in a different place. Another way to say is, when you try to globally minimize the energy, you cannot locally minimize everywhere. So this is a frustrated system. Proteins actually try to avoid that. So the difference between a sequence that can fold and a sequence that cannot fold is a sequence that you want to get one of these states and you want to make it stable relative to the states that you are competing against. OK, remember that this problem cannot be protein-like. Why not? Not only it would be very hard to find this minimum because a very very rough landscape. You can search, 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 search. And even if you have all the computer time in the world, all the search methods, if I find these states, if I do a minor variation on the system, I do a mutation, or I change the pH, or I change the temperature a little bit. This state may go up, this one may come down. So not only is an untrackable problem, even if I find the answer is worthless. So proteins have not only to fold relatively fast, but they have to default reliably. So you really have to have one state that dominates. And that comes with equations like that, that tells you this state has to be stable compared to all the states you are competing against. Right? So you have these things that tells you stability versus roughness. That makes protein design a total nightmare. Because not enough. A lot of mistakes people make is you start to over-design the state you want, but that may also bring some traps with you. Right, so when you're trying to optimize ratios, they are very easy to state here, but they're very hard to compute. But what that shows is, is the bottom line, is an idea of what we call this sort of situation. How do the proteins achieve, achieve this situation when one state is designed, the other state is not designed? Proteins actually do a damn good job on doing that. And that becomes with the idea that we call a folding funnel. And the folding funnel tells you Imagine, in the ideal situation, that I have a situation where all native interactions, all contacts, if I look at protein, I look at all the tertiary contacts, and I say, make them all attractive. And all the contacts between residues that are not on the final structure, they are repulsive. Or they are at least not attractive. That's what we call a perfect funnel. So that situation tells you the protein tries to make sure the interactions that maximize the structure you want are optimized to be attractive, and the interactions for the other structures are made repulsive. On the ideal funnel, we say we make this to the extreme limit. What we learn from proteins, or we learn a lot from proteins, and this model is able to do a very good job for the systems. That means we can identify all the folding pathways for proteins going to the native state. Also, the energetics not perfect, we find all the right geometry. So we create models. We create models based on crystal structures. So with this idea, but remember, before I move forward, proteins are not ideal, but means they do enough good job on optimizing energetics that most of the different intermediates and different states and different pathways that you observe coming down this folding funnel, the geometric effects are dominant over the energetic effects. So with this in mind, we have an entire set of models that have done and have worked to represent this situation. So I just want, I don't want to talk about protein folding too much, but I want to show you a couple of slides. So these models are models where we get the crystal structure of the protein. We do a potential that tells you optimize all the structure, all the context they bring to the native structure. And then we show if based on this crystal structure, this potential, if you can identify all these excited states and all these functional states of your system. 
So here is basically, there are many different models. Here is wh where our model tells you about. You start from unfold proteins and they come down and evolve towards your native state. What this figure shows you of the simulation is that basically start from unfolded states. These are states that are energetically very high. This energy is not real energy. They also include, include a little bit the effect of solvation. And as these states are coming down, you see as the protein evolve down in energy, they also get more structure. So there's a correlation between nativeness of the structure and the energy. So any model, our structural-based models or these goal models show is the ideal case of that. But in general, most of models, that's how the proteins do. That's how they survive, that's how they come down. However, remember, this is not rolling down into the system. Here's a protein, S6. If you look at simulation of how they evolve from these states, from multiple states up here to a few states here, this is a cartoon representation. You have lots of states. As you come down in energy, you're optimizing energy, but you have many, many less states as you come around. And the width of this funnel is what we call configuration entropy or the log rate or the number of states. So if you look at real simulation here, can you start this for me, please? You see that basically it's actually searching all the way around here. It's trying to get the structure of it, search around, gets part of the structure. You're coming down to the systems, and you see how it goes all the way until it finds in a simulation its final structure. So it's not a downhill process, it's a search process that goes down. But what's the message we have here? The message you have here is that basically proteins have been able to optimize themselves in such a way that native interactions are dominant over non-native interactions on this structure. In the long days, we have many simulations where we do big computational simulations versus simple simulations. So for example, on the next slide, it's a simulation we did many years ago, and there are many better ones these days with Charlie Brooks. At that time, we were both in San Diego. Now, Charlie's in Michigan. I'm here. John Chia is a professor at, at, at Santa Barbara. But if you have a look, as, the pro, as this protein evolves, you observe that's the folding of this very small SH3 motif, and you see that we, um, you see that we start from a very disordered state, you start to form all the local herpines. The herpines come together and make the pack, and then you finally fold. These results you couldn't differentiate. If you're running the simple model, or I made just the native interactions attractive, and non -native, or if I do a simulation with all the atoms, all the force fields, all the simulations, the details. Not the simulations are not good, they're details, but people have shown. And these days, David Shaw has been gigantic simulations that show that this is the case. So with this short introduction to protein folding, to tell you that basically the self-assembling of the system is that biology has been able to select sequences that are able to go towards the memory of the structure they want versus the other ones. So now what I can do? We can do better calculations on smaller proteins, and we have been doing that. We can do better by informatics metal, or we can apply this idea towards larger systems. And today, I'll tell you a little bit about motors. And why we care about motors? We care about motors because, as I told you already on the first slide, as you had a look on the first slide, these motors, they are, don't, they are not rigid machines. They fold and unfold, or they partially fold and unfold. We call cracking this effect as they evolve. So the entire methodology of folding should be helpful for us to understand. So if I go forward, here is kinesin. If you look, base again, this is a cartoon that's not correct. I got all this in the web just to bring people up because these things are much more diffusive than that. But they tend to walk on a microtube. They have steps that are eight nanometers apart, and they move with a velocity of, eight, of uh, 800, meters, uh, 800 nanometers per second. So a little bit more states. These are some experimental data, basically. I think this particular one came from Steve Block lab that's using, uh, doing single molecule experiments. And you observe that basically, first of all, the steps are eight nanometers. I want people to notice that. The second thing is the mechanical step, that's when kinesin walk eight nanometers. The mechanical steps happen as soon as ATP is bound. However, 
the chemistry takes place in the middle. Okay, so it's a very interesting problem to do because you can separate the chemistry from the mechanical part. Right, so when you have ATP hydrolysis, happens in the middle, I will comment about that. But the binding of ATP has the walk, and that's what we are interested in doing. More interesting, if we come along, this is kinesin. Let me bring the star of the show and tell you a little bit about the details about uh, this slide so we know the parts we'll be talking about. Kinesin has, I'm sorry, kinesin has two heads that we should call feet, but people call heads, so I'm not going to change the name. That's what walks through the microtube. They have the coil coil here where the load is bound to it. This is connected by these neck linkers that connect the coil coil to the heads. And this is very important because you say this is the part where you're going to look a lot of strain being built on this molecule as it moves around, so it keeps it specially. And here are the binding sites on the areas where basically all these nucleotides can bound to this molecule. But as you notice here, these two heads here are five nanometers apart. Actually, that's where we notice the first problem into this situation. I'll bring several problems. This is the crystal structure. But if you have a look about this system, first these things are five nanometers apart. What brings problem for me, because I know the steps are eight nanometers, so I have to reconcile this part. The other thing is, this ball of the crystal structure has a C2 symmetry, and that's almost like having your two feet like that. And it's very hard to walk like that. So I have to deal with this problem as, as I come along. But you'll see that would be not that difficult. As we come along, the other thing, or very interesting experiment that came around 2000 on cryo-EM of this, of this system that tells you here's kinesine, phi means empty. Let's forget about this one just for simplicity. This is when ATP is bound to the pocket, and this one ADP is bound to the pocket. So you see that basically when the kinesine is empty, it is strongly bound to the microtube, but the neck linker can be disordered. ATP is also strongly bound to the microtube, but you only can have ATP when the neck linker is ordered. And uh, ADP is when you are unbound to the microtube. Most of the time it's disordered, that's what you have. So you observe that you have this order disorder transition together with ATP binding, and that's where we think there is something that is a machine, like I told you, the disorder is part of the process. It's just not an annoyance of what I'm doing here. So if you look at the cycle of the system here, let's start from the beginning. This is something we draw based on the experimental data. If you have a look, you start with an empty head bound the microtube and one head with ADP. At this point, ATP binds. As soon as ATP binds, this head moves to the front. So you have the walk. So you have the walk. Now what you observe is that you cannot bind ATP too early. You only can bind ATP after you have the hydrolysis here, and then this unplug. Because if you bind ATP too early, you can have dual hydrolysis, and uh, the motor gets out, and you lose processivity. So the question is how I deal with this problem, and you notice how I avoid, and as expected, you're going to see that strain and disorder is what controls here. So disorder will be a functionally important step on these molecular motors, as is happening to be to kinases and to many other molecular motors as we, as we are learning as we move along. So how we did that? We came from protein folding. So if we came from protein folding, we look at this problem, and we thought about the following situation. Here is my structure, it's five nanometers apart. How do I bring eight nanometers? You observe that you get one of these heads and you twist around. Extra word, I cannot walk like that. I have to walk like that. So if you turn one of these heads around, you can get your eight nanometers by just breaking three bones by, or by just twisting three torsional angles on the neck linker. So by distorting the neck linker, but some strain neck link, I can get the eight nanometers. Now, which head do you turn around? We got another crystal structure. The crystal structure before between one head and the microtubule. Actually, it had a few different sequences, but there's not one, but you can do homology, no problem. So by that, I found the footprint. I see how the head binds to the microtubule. As soon as I find the, the footprint, then I get directionality. I know which is going to be the head that has to twist and will be on the front the leading head. 
right? Because they say figure out which one has met the microtube and which one has to twist, has to do between the footprint that you have here. So now I have a system. I can do a system like protein folding, but I do a competition protein folding. I tell you, my protein would like to fold into this shape. So I write a potential that put my protein folding into this shape. But my protein also would like to bind the microtube. So since one likes to, to bind the microtube, it's competing. So there's a no if it twists and binds the microtube or if it comes back. I don't have to be sophisticated. I can put the interactions like typical interactions, interactions between amino acids of the order of one kilocalorie per mole. But all the same, I can understand this problem. So when I put this competition, try to buy the microtubule versus try to go back to the crystal structure as being a single protein, I have my problem resolved. What you observe here is that I do the simulations. My leading head is severely disordered to the point, for example, that if I do the trailing head, the one on the back, the one that's happy, doesn't have to twist it, the neck linker, is two angstrom from just the crystal structure on average, while the other one is nine four angstrom. But what's more interesting is here, here's just the head, not the full protein. Alpha six here is around the nucleotide bind site. That's more where ATP binds. If I remove this alpha six, you see that now the distortion goes from 29.4 to 3.8. What tells you that neck linker stress create enough disorder on the ATP binding site, then now ATP cannot bind. So I keep that system distorted all the way until the system goes the way. So base disorder here tells you that you cannot do that. So how your system do? So your system operates into the following way. Your system operates in the way that tells you when you have the two heads bound here, this one is distorted. We only get out of here after hydrolysis takes place and ATP goes up, then the strain is released, then ATP can bind. So we're using disorder in order to avoid the thing. So I get directionality and avoid early binding and processivity to your system. So I know I'm getting short in time. Let me tell you one of the things. The other thing is just a minor thing. These things avoid ADP bind because you have this repulsion. But the most important thing is that you have disorder, avoid this thing to do. The next step here is how do I get now my mechanical step? How do I get this step that basically this thing moves forward into the mechanical step? So the way we did that, you can think about it, that if the neck linker is the case, I can get my Hamiltonian and I say, Let's do a very simple way of representing this chemistry. I will tell you when ATP is bound disorder, when ATP is bound disorder. So I just turn on and turn off the contacts between the neck linker and the protein. So I, that's an assumption that we are checking now with the tail simulation. I just turn on the contact. I say, when it, the disorder states the exactly these contacts are off. When ATP bound, these contacts are formed again by the ATP bind. And what you observe is, Turning on and turning off the contacts, you see before ATP binds, your system is staying on the back. After ATP binds, your system is able to move around and go down and bind to the states. Okay, so with this in mind, we, we are getting almost to the end of this story. You, you can understand that basically you have disorder, disorder in both cases control your system. You can imagine this coil coil is linked where it's neck link is like a spring. So by forming this contact, these two contacts, I just twist the spring one way and the other way, and your system goes backwards. So your system, entire system works the following way. ATP binds, you twist the spring, you move. When you have hydrolysis, you unplug, and you go downhill again, and you have this, this cycle. The entire cycle is downhill until hydrolysis. So it's a nice story that you have these very exciting states to go there. I'm, I'm all, one minute. Okay, so with this in mind, I want to refresh you with a couple things here. If you actually do now a simulation where you just turn on binding in the proper time scale, what the typical time, about 20 microseconds that you expect the time by going from the bound state to the unbound state, you observe that a single trajectory is actually very noise, but you want to average over multiple trajectories. Then you see what you see on the experiments. It would be great to have experiments that go on that. So let me just skip this for a I want to finish with this slide here to show you one thing. When we had this result, there are several people say, is this useful for anything? Is this an interesting tool? I think it's great because I understand the mechanism. I could tell you about many other motors that operate the same way. 
Here is mutations, basically, kept with Michael Deal, that's my colleague in bioengineering now, <coughs> where people search some mutations associated to hysteric paraplegia that we know that come from microtubule problems. What we observe is how we can play on the SIBO model. We can do these mutations by making the contacts broken by those particular residues. What we observe is very interesting things. If you do mutations at random, what you observe is you had one head order and one head disorder, just like I showed you. You just look at the MSD of these two heads when they're on the microtube, you have one order and one disorder. Now, residues that bound to the microtube, also now they create problem. If I make them bad, if you don't bite strong enough, then now you're in trouble. You don't have this difference between them, then you lose directionality, you lose processivity, the entire system is in trouble. But what amazes us is also the mutant dimerization effect, these are the mutants relate on the neck linker binding that basically has to do with this train, they also destroy your system. So you see that these motors, in order to work, they need two things. They have the interaction. They want to fold on that shape, and they don't want to walk the microtube. These are competing interactions. So you need the strong bind the microtube, but also you need the competition with a strain on the neck linker. Either of them kills you. If you don't have the strain, the system doesn't have processivity. It doesn't know to differentiate between the two heads. If you don't, have, don't buy the microtubule, you don't walk. Okay? So I want to finish here just to tell you people that this is sort of a nice, cool story where you can put simple models and complicate simulations together to build the entire story of protein folding. And now we can build this story for molecular motors, how you bring them together about this competition between order and disorder. Now, I know I'm out of time. But I just want to go back a couple of slides here just to finish. One of these is just to show you that basically each of these steps now we can compute very carefully. Uh, what I haven't told you today is this part we haven't done anything is this sort of chemical step because in our model we just say when hydrolysis takes place, the head unbinds. That's, a, that's an experimental fact. And just a number for curiosity of these molecular motors is the numbers appear to make sense. Because if you do a calculation between about 10 piconewtons times 8 nanometers, you get about 1 ATP of energy. That's more or less how much the stalling force for these motors. I mean, these things are all consistent. And since my time is up, I thank you for your attention. I have a very simple question. Is there evidence that both of those heads are bound simultaneously, or can it be that at no time are both heads simultaneously bound? And does that depend on the binding of the nucleotide? Okay. So <coughs> I think people can observe they're bound or not bound. So there's no question these days that if you have ATP bound, this head is bound, is bound to the microtube. And the empty heads are also bind the microtube. This, 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 this evidence is clear, right? And there's a lot of imaging on that, and there's a lot of also threat experiments and things like that. People have observed these things. These things have been awfully measured on the system, so it goes to the situation. So what's basic, what, and, and what's very interesting is that basically the ADP is never bind. Some other motors is exactly the opposite. If I told you the story of NCD, is the opposite. But you need this, this fact. Before or F bound or unbound, similar difference between ATP and ADP, all the motors have to do that. I'm, con I'm confused about directionality. Uh, if you have both, he both heads bound with ATP at the same time, you create a certain symmetry in the system. Why does it not unbind and go That's, backwards? Uh, maybe I was not clear enough, so let me repeat that. You see, the crystal structure has a C2 symmetry. The binding to the microtube has translational symmetry. So the system is like that. If you want to bind just on the symmetry, the only way this head is going to bound is by twisting, and that's where you get the strain. So that's, by, that's how you get that symmetry of the disorder head 
and the order head. So the leading head will be always, when you're both bound, the leading head will be disordered and the, and the back head was disordered. So one thing would be great to do an experiment, we have been asking this, is the following thing. If I have this here, and I was able to change the footprint of how to bind the microtube, then in principle I could walk the other direction. This is set because this one is going to be ordered, because this one can bind and fit to the microtube, while the other one has to get distorted. So if you don't have this sort of the, back, the, the trailing head order and the leading head disorder, you don't get the symmetry. That's how you get it. Since, uh, since Alzheimer's uh, disease, uh, Huntington's disease, Parkinson's, and a number of the other uh, neurologic degenerative diseases of the brain are thought to be related to abnormalities of protein folding, have you considered um, looking at some of these, applying your methods to some of these diseases? Oh, yes, basically. We didn't have a chance of talking about all the other applications we did here, but it's your question is well taken. So basically, what we understood about proteins, and that's a very, uh, let me break this point, is that most of the proteins, as they become functional, I just told you about molecular motors, they have to have these very active states that get order and disorder. That means that they have always some intrinsic flexibility on function, and that means that, they, that these things, when they go wrong, they can create this process of aggregation, all this other process. So we haven't gone to the aggregation disease on Parkinson. And the other thing is, on the case of Parkinson, for example, these are proteins that most of the time they are on the disorder state, and they can get ordered as they do some functionality. So the fact that this functionality of the proteins are related to order and disorder creates all this problem. But these models can deal with that, basically. We could give a full talk on that, or Peter could give a full talk on that, on other things that we have been doing these things. But it's, it's, it's very important to notice that, basically, if the proteins are always rock solid, life would be better. But the problem is they have to be flexible and be able to move for function. And when that part goes wrong, then you can have all the diseases associated with that. But there's a lot of work on that direction. Yeah, thank you.